Hi guys. The following are bits uh, and pieces of information that I've gathered over the past few years. And um, recently, these past few weeks, seem to have all come together like pieces of a puzzle. Uh, there are many, many correlations to many different stories, allegories, uh, and scriptures. And there are many different thoughts throughout this video, but it's only scratching the surface of the topic. Um, it is a quite lengthy video, but I do encourage you to watch uh, until the end the entire video, because at the end I'm going to share uh, a little personal piece of information that seems to have foretold um, this video and the information therein. So you're free to reject or receive any or all of the explanations or the interpretations that follow because they are from my own personal viewpoint. The specific puzzle piece that seemed to bring it all into a cohesive picture or story was the seventh commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who takes his name in vain. Exodus 20 verse 7 and I don't mean like, oh my God. No, that's not taking the Lord's name in vain. Because God isn't a name. That's not a proper noun. It's just a noun. It's just, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's just a noun. It's not a proper noun. It's not a name. The meaning that, um, that I feel that it's trying to to portray is don't use the name of the Lord your God in vanity for your own vain or prideful purpose i.e. Um, the Israelites claiming in a literal sense to be quote God's chosen people or religion above all other peoples this would also include um, Christians believing they are Christ's chosen people over all other peoples and any other race, creed, class, or religion, even those Israelites who, uh, you, the Jewish who don't believe in Christ, somehow the Christians uh, morphed it into, like, nope, they're the ones, that their religion is, is, and their God is the one, is, is the real one. And also, in a sense that, um, the same kind of sense is people who aren't even non, or who, who aren't religious or non-religious people, um, will just say on the extreme, um, an extreme atheist, that would be considered their own mind or their own intellect would be the Lord their God. So basically, <clears throat> my interpretation of this is, uh, not, oh my God, that's that's fine that, that's fine whatever um, I believe it just means don't use your personal or your geographical God or your intellect as an excuse as permission or as validation for your own prideful vain thoughts words and deeds this verse repetitively uh, kept reappearing in the forefront of my mind um, over these past, probably like over the past five or six weeks, in between me trying to make those other videos, which I, it took me so long because my mind was on, on this and I was getting all kinds of different uh, correlations and connections in my mind on this as I was trying to to um, finish producing that other video so I it took me a long time to do that one because I had to keep stopping and writing down um, all all of this so this one verse just kept coming back to to the forefront of my mind over and over again and it quickly brought back a whole bunch of correlations to multiple religious and mythological quote persons and clearly telling the same exact story and teaching the same exact lesson this was all formed around pride and vanity 
Pride cometh before the fall was the following verse that swirled around with the previous verse. Then the story of the fallen angels came in. Lucifer, morning stars, fall came um, uh, into the forefront. Then flashes of the story of Psyche and Eros. And then Narcissus, Narcissus. Uh, mythos joined in, then Pista Sophia, Ayal the Bayoth, Gnostic Nerea, daughter of Eve, fighting with the Archons, and then all of a sudden I remember Dr. Young and the discussions of the anima and the animus, and that led me to further correlations in Jacob and wrestling with God, and it seemed to all tie everything, everything together. We need to really go to the depths of what, what this means. Pride cometh before the fall. Pride exists in man's psyche and represents a lower god or a manifested entity of the lower ego. But before we jump into the religious correlations and the mythos stories, um, uh, I want to lay down some foundation so that we can understand a little bit more about the psyche and the hidden or the veiled parts of our own minds or our own consciousness. We'll begin with archetype or the archons. Archetype comes from the Greek verb archaean, to begin or to rule, and the noun typos, type. Archetype is a specific use in the field of philosophy and in psychology. Plato believed that all things have an ideal or a specific form or an archetypal face image of which real things are merely shadows or just copies. Jung assigns four major archetypes, the self, the anima, the animus, and the shadow. He believed that there were 12 distinct, typical human qualities and faults that were developed, and he called these archetypes. He says that the four main archetypes can be intermingled and give rise to 12 archetypal figures, also known as archetypal images, and these include the ruler, creator, artist, sage, the innocent, the explorer, the rebel, the hero or the savior, the wizard, the jester, and the everyman, as well as the lover and the caregiver. Now, in my opinion, some basic examples of our mental archons, archetypes, or rulers, which are, uh, in effect, our achievements, our aspirations, as well as our fears, our phobias, criticisms of self and from others, resentments, regrets, passions, desires, etc. Um, these rulers which we, quote, breathe the breath of life into, end quote, or that we manifest in our dreams as actual people and or beasts and subsequently through our uh, thoughts, beliefs, words, actions, deeds, in our daily and physical life. They are as follows. Now, the positive female personas contrasted by the negative shadow personas are, are listed. Um, for the female, the archetype would be mother or nurse, the caregiver, the virgin, the maiden, the fair princess, the innocent child, and then their shadow cohorts would be, um, for the mother or the nurse, would be the hag or the witch. For the virgin or the maiden or the princess would be the temptress. The innocent child would be transformed into a rebellious youth. Then we have the positive male personas or archons contrasted by their negative shadow personas. And for the males, we would have the father or the king, um, shadowed by the grim reaper or the tyrant, um, sometimes a dragon. Uh, we'll have on the positive side a prince, a savior, a young hero. Uh, on the shadow side, some sort of an animal or a beastly image, demon, 
um, someone, uh, a, a, an enslaver or a captor, uh, on the positive side, the innocent, again, child, um, a lot of times shown by a suckling child with the mother. So um, the innocence, you know, is extremely innocent, uh, contrasted with the shadow side of a small toddler or a small child that's very foolish and impulsive and rebellious. Um these aren't by any means, uh, like I've only, I've shown you 12, but every, all of these can be mixed and a little bit taken away, more of this added. Uh, um, I think that there can be an, an unnum, an unnumerable amount that you could create out of this. The mind is, ah, the mind is a masterful machine. We'll start with Dr. Jung's um, description of the anima and the animas. And basically, the anima and the animas is that which animates a thing, making the thing alive or causing it to act or and or behave in a particular way or a particular manner. First, we'll take the root of the anima and animas, which is anim or anim which means in latin mind and spirit or spirit mind now the suffix a for anima sometimes a e is a word forming element which in the english is characteristic of feminine nouns the anima the suffix us for animus comes from the latin and denotes a masculine characteristic. So you have the masculine animus and the female anima. Dr. Young describes the anima as the feminine principle as present in the male unconscious and the animus as the male principle as present in the female unconscious. I would also say um, unconscious, your personal unconscious and collective unconscious is what uh, Jung would say, and Freud would call it the subconscious and the unconscious mind. But they're all the psychic or the um, um, intellectual mind. So it's my understanding or my interpretation that the anima, the, the female and the animus, are two-faced and each have a shadow of itself. And I believe that Jung separates, well, I, I know that he does, Young separates the shadow, the anima, the animus, and the persona, and makes them all individuals, but all parts of the psyche or soul. Um, now, I also want to add from my own personal experience um, that uh, in dreams, when we experience water in, in dream symbolism, it's to show that we are in a subconscious or unconscious uh, watery realm, a mental psychic realm. Water themed dreams, nautical with boats and or sea creatures, etc., are, in my mind, indicating material reflections from the water, the subconscious, of one's immortal strengths and weaknesses. Now, in order to tell if um, it's, I don't want to say good or bad, but uh, good or bad anima, animus, good, the, the main divine anima or animus figure versus their shadow or their lower self, you can tell what what's happening within your dreams. And it's my only my opinion, but um, that it's an indicative of the feeling that you receive while in the dream state in relation to the images seen and the characters that are seen. For example, if you see a still lake in a meadow with the sun shining down, you you probably have a good, peaceful, happy feeling, and you know that you're in a good and a helpful place of the subconscious. Now, if you see a black ocean, everything's black, there's no sun, it's nighttime, um, and you're surrounded by black, choppy water, turbulent waves crashing all over the time, you know that you're in an even a deeper state of the mind, 
um, where a lot of your hidden fears and phobias uh, uh, lie. Um, in my opinion, that's like when you're entering into the unconscious mind, the very, very depths of the psyche. And also, in my opinion, there's much less imagery uh, in the form of imagery. In the unconscious mind, it's just like a vastness. There are imagery you can pull through, but uh, it's usually one picture of something like... Um, uh, I, 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 I can't. I just gave you a couple of my, my examples and dreams that I've had. The, uh, the black crashing waters in the middle of night and um, actually in that dream, <laughs> I was in the middle of the ocean, the chappy, black, whatever. I wasn't scared though. I was in the water and all of a sudden I heard this male, <laughs> it, it definitely was my, um, my animus. It was this male voice that I heard and it seemed to come from a 360 direction. It, it wasn't like it came from the right or the left or the front or the back. It was like everywhere, all encompassing. And this voice um, said, uh, what did it say to me? It was just one. It was very, very short. It said, oh, it said, but you still have your clothes on. And I looked up into the sky, uh, into this blackness, and my arms are whatever, and I answered back, I know how to swim, I'll be fine. And the voice just said, okay. And that was it. But, um, yeah, I was definitely in the depths of the sub, or in the depths of the, um, unconscious mind, and, um, yeah, that voice was telling me, why are you here? You still have, quote, clothes on or fleshly garments. You're not going to be able to swim or float or do whatever you think that you're going to do. That dream was a couple of years ago. I've, I've since uh, come out of the dark choppy waters. But just an example from my experience of what um, uh anima like these these god figures these male female and pictures in 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 dreams so not concretely but generally speaking if you are female certain male aspects have been created and then hidden and separated um, if you're a male specific female aspects and characteristics have been created by but separated and hidden from you and by you and um, they're also created to some extent and degree by your cultural social uh, family background uh, like um, your religious or lack of um, uh, religious upbringing uh, the era uh, the time in history that you were born uh, the place on the globe that you were born etc 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 Additionally, I believe that these negative archetypal images uh, and, and characters, gods and demons, angels, etc., uh, etc., et uh, mother figures, father figures, kings, queens, blah, 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 um, I, I believe that they're all mental, psychic, quote-unquote, leftovers from our last incarnation that we didn't fully transmute. Uh, in Pistis Sophia chapter 100, it leads me um, to uh, to this assumption. It says, speaking about the souls, Jesus and the and the disciples are sitting around, and they're they're talking about the archons and um, and their souls. And it says, quote, "Ye then, in particular, are the refuse of the treasury, and ye are the refuse, the leftovers, of the region of the right." And you are the refuse of the region of those of the midst. And you are the refuse of all the invisibles and of all of the rulers or the archons. In a word, ye are the refuse of all of these. And ye are in great sufferings and great afflictions in your being poured from one into another of different kinds of bodies of the world. Different kinds of bodies, uh, incarnations, hmm, 
Additionally, uh, anytime that you see me quoting something and uh, there's parentheses, those are my own notes. So, um, yes, I definitely believe this. And then we also see in um, Still Pista Sophia, but chapter 27, quote, It came to pass then when the rulers, the archons of the aeons, so the archons or the archetypes, and those of the fate and those of the sphere continued to carry out this type, turning on themselves and devouring or eating the refuse, the trash or the garbage of their matter, the mortal soul or lower egos, and not allowing the higher egos or the spiritual souls to be born into the world of mankind in order that they, spiritual souls and higher egos, might delay in being the rulers and that the powers which are in their powers, that is, that the souls might spend a long time here on the outside in chaos and in the darkness hanging out with the shadow archons. Jesus Christ Jesus, Son, or S-U-N, S-O-L, Soul, or S-O-U-L, Soul of Man, Jesus, Soul of Man, Lower Ego, or Corruptible, Mortal Soul, Christ, Son, or Soul, of God, Higher Ego, Incorruptible, Immortal, spiritual soul. This is my interpretation of Luke 12, 10. Quote, And everyone who speaks a word against, or gives condemnation, to the Son of Man, the mortal, corruptible soul, will be forgiven. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, the immortal spiritual soul, will not be forgiven. End quote. Now, this interpretation is further strengthened by a passage in the Apocrypha of James, or the Secret Book of James, which, and I'll link that in the description box below as well, which um, Jesus states, quote, Do you not desire then to be filled? And is your heart drunk? Do you not desire then to be sober? Therefore, be ashamed. And now, waking or sleeping, remember that you have seen the Son of Man, the lower ego, and with him you have spoken, and to him you have listened. Woe to those who have seen the Son of Man, and blessed are those who have not seen that man, and who have not consorted with him and who have not spoken with him, and who have not listened to anything from him, for yours is life. And therefore know that he healed you when you were ill, in order that you might reign. Woe to those who have rested from their illness, because they will relapse again into illness. And blessed are those who have not been ill, and have not known rest before they came, became ill. Yours is the kingdom of God. Therefore I say to you, become full, and leave no place within you empty, since the coming one, the higher spiritual immortal Christ, is uh, able to mock you, the lower soul, the son of man, or the image of physical Jesus, I believe, is your unbalanced shadow, animus or the devil or the satan figure uh somewhere in the bible it says uh speaking about jesus that he wasn't pleasant to look upon and people just say oh that just means that outwardly he wasn't no that's the lower ego he was not pleasant to look upon so um yeah your your physical jesus image that everybody prays to is the unbalanced shadow animus, which is the devil or the Satan 
um, figure. And it's the shadow of your true savior, your immortal um, soul, your immortal Christ. This verse in Matthew is made clearer through the interpretation of the Son of Man and the Son of God. Matthew seven twenty two, Many will say to me, the higher soul or Christ, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils and demons, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I, Christ, the spiritual soul, will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in iniquity. Christ, the higher soul and man, never knew them because they were worshiping and following the, the image, man Jesus, the lower ego, the corruptible soul. They never knew the real Savior or the real Christ. Okay, so the animus, the male characteristics in a female, if are if it's well adjusted or well integrated, balanced, it'll be a source of strength, sound mental reasoning, self worth, self assuredness, stability, and proper guidance. Now, if the animus is not well adjusted. He will appear in dream figures and in waking life through one's own words, actions, and deeds as an overcritical, insecure, extremely prideful, arrogant, egotistical, self-aggrandizing, angry, vengeful, stubborn, unforgiving, uncompassionate, authoritarian, black and white, good and evil, law over circumstance, facts over feelings, no considerations, no in-between, no freaking gray areas. And that's the animus, not well-adjusted. And in a male, the anima, or the female characteristics, if they are properly integrated and implemented, balanced within the man's life, it'll provide a source of charity, chastity, purity, love, compassion, comfort, peace, spiritual insight, intuition, and a positive creative imagination. But the male's anima shadow side will be expressed in hate, jealousy, fear, sexual promiscuity, anxiety, stress, delusions of self and of the material world, and being unbalanced is only co-creating or procreating with solely or minimally the male side of a male psyche. And the same goes for females who only associate with their female aspects and don't properly integrate or um, uh, come into balance with their with their male aspects. I wasn't going to add this because I just feel I'm not like super confident of it. I just feel like it goes along with it, but it's not like solid. Um, possibly, I also believe that this anima or the animus, the male or the female uh, archetypes that are within our psyches can be used um, in the interpretation for the two witnesses spoke of uh, in Revelation 11 verse 4. They are, quote, two olive trees, end quote, and the two lampstands, end quote, they stand for the Lord of the earth, end quote. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. So no spiritual, um, no spiritual waters coming to them. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth or the flesh with every kind of plague as often as they wish. Now, these same anima or animus uh, characters or psychic 
psychic characters, archetypes, and images are seen throughout history and within religious and mythos texts, as well as in our fairy tale stories. We have the fair maiden, usually um, beauty, sleeping beauty, um, beauty and the beast. We have a fair maiden who is rescued by the knight in shining armor, or we have the prince who awakens the sleeping princess with a kiss, and the princess who falls in love with the frog or the beasts, and only through true unconditional love is the curse broken and the frog or the beast then turns into the handsome prince. These are all anima and animus archetypes. The divine male ends up saving the female, and then other stories, um, Beauty and the Beast, the divine female saves the male, ending always in marriage or a marriage of divine spirit and divine soul. The story of Psyche and Eros or Cupid is one of these stories and one that has personal significance to me as I will explain later at the end of the video. Psyche in Greek means human soul, so there is no question as to what the story is conveying. Psyche was the third daughter, her two sisters being flesh and free will, we know exactly what we're talking about here, of a wealthy king and was known as the most beautiful of the three daughters as well as she was considered the most beautiful in all the land. Now, when news had gotten around, Aphrodite heard of this, and jealousy and pride raged within her, as she was known as the goddess of love, passion, and of beauty. Driven by pride, she instructed her son, Eros, which means physical desire made manifest, to put a spell or a curse on Psyche, the human soul, as she slept, as she slept. His mother told him Psyche was to be his slave. I suggest that this means that the human soul is a slave to physical desire. So Eros flew down to earth with his two vials of potions, and him being invisible, he sprinkled the sleeping Psyche, the lower ego, or the lower soul, with a potion that would make men avoid her when it came to marriage. He accidentally pricked her with one of his arrows, though, which made someone fall in love instantly, and she was startled awake. Her beauty, in turn, startled Eros, or physical desire, and he accidentally, wink, wink, pricked, pricked himself as well. On accident, physical desire pricked himself. Uh-huh. So, after having the cup of forgetfulness potion upon her lips, Psyche, although still very beautiful, could find no husband. Her parents, afraid that they had offended the god somehow, asked an oracle to reveal Psyche's future husband. And the oracle said that while no man would have her, there was a creature on top of a mountain that would marry her. When she came within sight, she was lifted by a gentle wind and carried the rest of the way. When she arrived, she saw that her new home was in fact a rich and a beautiful palace. Her new husband never permitted her to see him physically in the daylight, but he proved to be a true and a gentle lover. He, of course, was Eros himself. After a while, Psyche's sister, flesh and free will, came to visit, and out of jealousy and pride, they created doubt and fear about Eros. They went to her and they told her, Don't forget, your husband has to be some kind of a monster, since he will not allow you to see his face and he only comes to you in the darkness. And that he was, only fattening her up in order to eventually kill and eat her. Since it's so lengthy, I'll just go ahead and skip to the end of the story. 
After Psyche goes through some very difficult tasks, she and Eros are brought together, and Psyche sees that Eros has now been transformed from the beast in the darkness of her imagination into a handsome young man, and they are joined together as one, and Psyche is then transmuted into an immortal soul from a mortal soul, and now she and Eros together are pure spirit and pure spiritual soul. This shows that the mortal soul falling in love or physical desire for oneself in a, man, in, a, in a manifested material form. Psyche fell for Eros, the, um, the, human, the human soul or intellect, fell for Eros, physical desire, and Eros, physical desire, in turn, fell for Psyche, the human or the material soul. These falls were brought about by the anima shadow figure of Aphrodite, her immense pride and jealousy. We also see the same kind of theme in Genesis 6 too, the fall of the angels. These were the sons, S-O-N's, S-U-N's, S-O-L's of God. Physical desire, air of spirit, saw the daughters of men, the human psyche or the human soul in physical form, or the fleshly soul, and they were fair, they were beautiful, and they took them wives of all which they chose. This story has nothing to do with um, a, a literal angel or demon figure coming out of the cosmos and falling to the earth and, um, quote, mating with a with a literal human being, a literal woman. This is all mental. Absolutely everything is, is mental. It's all in your psyche. That's what the story is about. We also see vanity, pride, and the love of physicality in the story of Narcissus, the male aspect of the human soul, or your um, animus, uh, Aphrodite, nemesis, the goddess of revenge, saw Narcissus, who vowed to never marry uh, Echo or any other female aspect. You can look into this story to find out who Echo is, but he rejected Echo. And um, so Aphrodite, Venus, nemesis, decided to punish Narcissus, and um, he was getting really, really thirsty one day after, after he was hunting. And the goddess lured him to a pool of water, his subconscious, where he leaned upon the water and he saw himself in the bloom of youth, which to me means um, foolishness and still being stubborn. Narcissus did not realize that it was merely his own reflection or the intellect in a human form or a physical form, and he fell deeply in love with it, as if it were another young man, and unable to leave the allure of his image, he eventually realized that his love could not be reciprocated. Because of this, he then melted away due to the fire of passion burning inside of him, and eventually turned into a gold and a white flower known as the Narcissus, the Narcissus, or the daffodil. In Isaiah 14, you see the fall of Lucifer. You have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, sun of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, O you who have weakened the nations. Now, most people associate the morning star with Venus, which she is. Um, she is known as the morning star, though she's not a star, but she's actually a planet. Um, morning, because um, she, she does, um, at certain times of the year, Venus will rise with the sun. So she is a morning, you can say star in that respect. But then at other times, she's known as an evening star 
when she comes out after the sun, has uh, she rises at the fall of the sun. Now, Mercury, too, has its turn at being a morning and an evening star, because it, too, at certain times of the year, will rise with the sun, or it rises with the setting of the sun. Now, all of this plays in with the Eros um, uh, psyche uh, uh, mythos, because Eros, desire of the son of Venus, Aphrodite, attacking Psyche, or the mental faculties of the soul represented by Mercury. But the one thing um, that to me seemingly is overlooked by far is the, the one thing that um, is constant in those, and that's the sun, the actual sun the S-U-N, or the S-O-L, the sun, the soul, as the true morning star. It's the true morning star. The verbiage used to describe the message to me is uh, glaringly clear, and it, to me it can't be more straightforward um, what, this, what this verse says. Um, how you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning. Um, that, that is the sun. It represents the rising in intellectual consciousness, symbolized by the rising of the external or the material sun, soul, soul, or the psyche. And then at sunset, it's, it's represented falling into the lower ego of the intellectual consciousness. Pride, vanity, arrogance, etc., etc., symbolized in the star or the sun or the soul, S O L, or the soul, S O U L, the mortal, mortal soul, lower ego, setting or falling into the darkness or into chaos. So I'll re read the entire passage from Isaiah. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee. Even all the chief ones of the earth are the lower ego, the archons, the anima and anima shadow figures. It hath rised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp, arrogance and pride, is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy voice the worms spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of soul or the human psyche intellect made manifest of the morning how art thee cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations for there hath said in thine heart enter arrows physical desire i will ascend into heaven and i will exalt my throne above the stars of god elevating the corruptible physical soul or psyche over the spiritual and immortal souls. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. <clears throat> I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. When I read, thou shalt be brought down to the, quote, sides of the pit, it makes me think of the temporal lobes which are situated on the sides of the lower brain, the cerebellum. And that is the cerebellum, hell, or the pit. And it's also shaped exactly like a human heart, the cerebellum is. And thus, he thought in his heart. This area of the brain, the temporal sides, allow an individual to understand speech, language, the ability to hear sounds, and importantly, it controls our memory. So, in like 
the lower ego, ego or the material soul will be confined in a realm of silence, confusion, and will have no memory of its wrongdoings. Essentially, it's being given the cup of forgetfulness that it must, quote, shake off in this lifetime or be doomed to repeat the process again through future physical incarnations. The Fall of Pistis Sophia It happened that the realm wisdom of conceptual thought began to think for herself. She used the thinking and the foreknowledge of the invisible spirit. For she intended to reveal an image from herself out of pride and material physical desire, to do so without the consent of the divine spirit who did not approve, without the thoughtful assistance of her divine spiritual masculine counterpart who did not approve, without the invisible spirit's consent, without the knowledge of her partner, she brought it into being. Because she had unconquerable power, her thought was not unproductive. Something imperfect came out of her. It was different in appearance from her. Because she had created it without her masculine counterpart, she gave rise to a misshapen lower ego or the, or the mortal soul, being unlike herself, the higher ego or the immortal spiritual soul. But then Sophia saw what her desire, or material desire, Eros, produced. It changed into a form of a dragon with a lion's head, prideful, and eyes flashing lightning bolts. She cast him far from her, outside of the realm of the immortal beings, so that they could not see him. She had created him in ignorance. Sophia surrounded him with a brilliant cloud, put a throne in the center part of the cloud so that no one would see it except for the Holy Spirit, called the Mother of the Living. She named him Yeldabaoth. Now, Yeldabaoth, known also as Saklaz and Samael, is the chief ruler. He took great power from his mother. He left her and he moved away from his birthplace. He assumed the command, and then he created realms, psychic realms, for himself with a brilliant flame or the astral light that continues to exist even to this day. Now, Ayaldebaoth also means child of chaos, and if you do a little bit of research into who Eros' uh, father is, you'll see um, that it says, at least one or two accounts say that Eros is the child of Aphrodite and Chaos. So Eros and Ieldebaoth both are the children or the sons of Chaos. In the hypostasis of the Archons, or the reality of the, of the rulers listed in the description box below, we read, Ieldebaoth and Samael sin. Because of the reality of the authorities, inspired by the spirit of the Father of Truth, the great messenger, referring to the authorities of the darkness, or the mortal soul, or lower ego's sub and unconscious mind, told us that, quote, Our contest is not against flesh and blood, but rather the authorities, principalities, of the universe and the spirits of wickedness, end quote. I have sent you this because you inquire about the reality or the truth of these authorities or these archons or these anime and animus shadow figures. Their chief is blind and because of his power and of his ignorance and of his pride and arrogance, he said with his power, I am God and there is no other but me. When he said this, he sinned against all. This speech rose up to incorruptibility. There was a voice that came from incorruptibility saying, You were wrong, Samael, that is, God of the blind. 
his thoughts became blind, and having expelled his power, that is, the blasphemy that he had spoken, he pursued it down to chaos, which is his father, and the abyss, his mother, at the instigation of Pista Sophia. She established each of his offspring in conformity with its power. After the power, after the pattern of the realms that are above, for by starting from the invisible world, the visible world was invented. The rulers laid plans and said, Come, let us create a human that will be soil from the earth. They modeled their creature as one wholly from the earth or the material mortal soul. The rulers, or the archons, the shadow anima and animus, have bodies that are both female and male, and faces that are the faces of the beasts, fleshly desires. They took some soil from the earth, and they modeled their man after their body and after their image, their own intellect and physical form, of God that had appeared to themselves within the waters of the subconscious mind. Then they said, quote, Come, let us lay hold of it, the lower ego or the human psyche, which is designed female, by means of the form that we have modeled, so that it may see its male partner, and we may seize it from the form that we have modeled, not understanding the partner of God because of their own powers, powerlessness. And he breathed into its face, and the man came to have a soul, and he remained on the ground many days, but they could not make him rise because of their powerlessness. And like storm winds, they persisted in blowing, that they might try to capture the image which had appeared to them in the waters, and they did not know the identity of this power. Now all these events came to pass by the will of the Father of all. Afterward the Spirit saw the man of soul on the ground, and the Spirit came forth from the Adamatine land, and it descended and came to dwell in him, and that man then became a living or a spiritual soul. And the Spirit called his name Adam, since he was found on the, on the ground moving about. The rulers took Adam, this lower or this mortal ego consciousness, and put him in the garden in the psychic or mental realms that he might cultivate it and keep watch over it. They issued a command to him saying, From every tree in this garden shall you eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil don't eat it and don't even touch it. For the day you eat from it you will surely die. They said this to him, but they did not understand what they said. Rather, by the Father or the All's will, they said this in such a way that he might in fact want to eat, and that Adam might not regard them as would just a man of exclusively just a material or a lower ego nature. The transmutation or the fall and rise, or the fall and the resurrection of the soul. The rulers took counsel with one another and said, Come, let us cause a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept. Now, the deep sleep that they caused to fall on him, and he slept, is ignorance. They opened his side, which was like a living woman, and they built up his side with some flesh in her place. And Adam came to be only of soul resurrection. But the woman of spirit came to him, the divine female spirit of the higher ego, and spoke with him, saying, Arise, Adam. And when he saw her, he said, It is you who have given me life. You will be called mother of the living, for she is my mother. She is the physician and the woman and she is given birth. Eve became pregnant, and she bore Norea. And she said, He has produced for me a virgin as an assistant for many generations of human beings. 
She is the virgin whom the forces did not defile. Norea, the incorruptible virgin spirit, battles the archons or the shadow anima animus rulers. The rulers went to meet her, Norea, intending to lead her astray. Their supreme chief, Ayel the Bayaf, Samael, Saklaz, Eros, said to her, Your mother Eve came to us. You must serve us as your mother Eve did. Remember, Aphrodite told Eros, Eros, physical desire, that Psyche, human soul, was supposed to be his slave or to serve him. But Norea turned to them and she said, it is you who are the rulers of the darkness, and you are accursed. You did not know my mother. Instead, it was your own female, i.e. shadow anima created from the arrogant self-adulation or pride, vanity, that you knew, for I am not your descendant. Rather, it is from the world above, spiritual not physical realms, that I come from. In all these stories, we see images and pictures of positive and negative aspects of female and male. And while well, Jung seems to assign the anima as the main repressed aspect of a man, and the animus as the main repressed aspect of a woman, I very much feel that a woman um, can be operating uh, with that strong, heavy male spirit um, uh, and, and need to integrate their female aspects uh, within the same, the same thing with males that primarily operate from their female aspects and need to integrate um, the, the male sp uh, spirit into them in, in, in a balanced way. The Gospel of Thomas, listed in the description box below, in my opinion, shows the following correlations to everything that um, this video has been about. Uh, quote, for many of the first will be last and will become a single one. Jesus said, two will recline on a couch. One will die, the mortal soul, and one will live, the immortal spiritual soul. Salome said, Who are you, mister? You have climbed onto my couch and eaten from my table as if you are from someone. Jesus said to her, I am the one who comes from what is whole. I was granted from the things of my father. I am your disciple. For this reason I say, If one is whole, one will be filled with light. But if one is divided, one will be filled with darkness. They said to him, Then shall we enter the Father's kingdoms as babies? And Jesus said to them, When you make the two into one, and when you make the inner like the outer, and the outer like the inner, and the upper like the lower, and when you make the male and the female into a single one so that the male will not be male nor the female be female when you make eyes in place of an eye a hand in place of a hand a foot in place of a foot an image in the place of an image then you will enter the kingdom and jesus said when you make two into one, you will become children of Adam. And then when you say, mountain, move from here, it will move. Simon Peter said to them, make Mary leave us, for females don't deserve life. And Jesus said, look, I will guide her to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males for every female who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven 
So I believe that the anima and the animus, along with their dark, shadowy co-parts, are found in both male and females, and we are to integrate the two higher anima and animus within ourselves to a marriage, so to speak, and making the higher aspects of male and female the Divine Mother and the Divine Father, no longer separate, but one complete single unit working together within man. Stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, your psyche. Then you will be able to test and to prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So flee from the evil desires of youth or eros and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And a little bit of word wizardry for you. Uh, material or physical desire is Eros. That's what we've learned. Eros, spelled backwards, is sore. <laughs> and Eros, meaning desire, if we look at the word desire, and you take the prefix de, which means to remove, and the word sire, s-i-r-e, meaning kingship or royalty, then we get the, then we have the removing of kingship or the removal of your crown or your royalty. We were made to bow down because of the infection or the sore of arrows. So man and woman know thyself and be aware that arrows, material or physical desire, wishes to make a slave of your mortal soul. So don't bow to his bow. And before I close this all out, I will share some images with you that uh, initially did not mean anything specifically until the past couple of years and and really um, delving into everything that that I've been delving into and learning of the psyche and arrows or Cupid at 20 years old I uh, I got a Cupid or an arrows tattoo on my right shoulder like I said, no particular reason other than symbolizing love. Um, so I got it. Approximately 19 to 20 years later, I got my second and the last tattoo that I will get. And it happens to be a Chinese symbol. And the symbol means beauty. <clears throat> Unconsciously, I suppose that I chose its location because I had them put it at the nape of my neck or at the base of my skull or close to my brain stem or the cerebellum. Um, and as you can see in my picture, that Eros is pointing his arrow at that beauty symbol. Eros is shooting Psyche beauty with his love arrows. I had no conscious awareness, as I'm saying, uh, of what I was doing clearly, but uh, inevitably, I suppose <laughs> that the story was meant to be experienced, uh, shared, and um, an actual image of it on my physical being. Yeah. All righty, all my soul sisters and brothers out there. I hope that this video um, has helped a few people that are watching or, or will watch. I've certainly enjoyed sharing all the insights with you. Please help support the channel in future content, more videos to come. 
by commenting, liking, and sharing the video. You can donate if you wish, but uh, you'll find links somewhere for that. But please leave comments, give it a like, and share is the way to get more people to um, have access to it. So, until the next time, love yourselves and love each other unconditionally. Peace.